Thank you for the lovely introduction. Uh, I now know that the Hollywood writer's gene is carried on in the Zimmering family. Um, uh, and that's terrific. Uh, only other addition, uh, Joel Seligman, the former dean of Washington University. His father was a, a motion picture and television director as well. So, so now we have four uh, uh, of us Hollywood brats. Uh, uh, alas, uh, I've uh, uh, um, one correction to Professor Zimmering's introduction. Uh, my parents do not believe that I've gone in an upward trajectory. They can't figure out why I'm still in school after all these years. So, <laughs> Um, okay, so what I want to talk to, to you today about is uh, the past, present, and future of the Second Amendment. Uh, and I think there's surprising things to discover in each one of those three categories. Um, I'm going to do it a little bit uh, oddly ordered, perhaps. I'm going to talk about the present first, then talk about the past, and then talk about the future. When we get to the future, I'm going to conclude with um, uh, an argument that uh, what the future holds for the Second Amendment is irrelevant. OK, so the present. So wh where are we in the gun debate today? Well, in 2008, the Supreme Court issued a landmark ruling in a case called District of Columbia against Heller. Uh, District of Columbia against Heller was the first case where the Supreme Court unambiguously uh, read the Second Amendment to protect an individual right to bear arms and struck down a gun control law for violating that right. The law struck down was a ban on handguns in Washington, D.C. Now, when this decision came down in 2008, a lot of people, especially people in the gun rights community, thought that this Heller case was going to be um, the start of a revolution. That because of uh, the right to bear arms being recognized by the Supreme Court, uh, it would lead to uh, cascading gun control laws. Uh, gun control laws would fall one after another, uh, and we'd get rid of so many of the silly gun control laws uh, in the country. That was not just the wishful thinking of gun rights advocates. It was the sincere fear of many gun control advocates, too, that you now invigorate this right. That's going to lead to many laws being struck down. So there was a lot of fear and a lot of hope, depending on where you uh, situate yourself in the gun debate. But a funny thing happened on the way to the courthouse after the Heller case, which is that virtually every gun control law that, that is currently on the books was challenged under the Second Amendment. And since 2008 and 2017, we've had over 1,000 federal court decisions on the constitutionality of gun control laws. Uh, a lot of decisions. There's been a tidal wave of judicial uh, decisions on the Second Amendment. But what's happened has defied the expectations of gun rights advocates and the fears of gun control advocates. Because what's happened is, is that the courts have upheld nearly every single law that's come before it, that would come before them, uh, the courts. Uh, the courts have struck down, as they did in the Heller case, they struck down a ban on handguns in the home. Uh, that was a law that was only in existence in two cities, two major cities, Chicago, Washington, D.C. No state had a ban on handguns. Um, uh, so a pretty limited uh, scope of that, uh, uh, of that kind of gun control. That law was struck down. And since then, we've seen very few other laws struck down as a violation of the Second Amendment. We have seen some laws struck down. Uh, for instance, uh, just last week, there was a ruling by the Seventh Circuit. Uh, and the Seventh Circuit struck down a gun control law uh, in the city of Chicago. Uh, to understand what the, the law was a restriction on the operation of gun ranges in the city of Chicago. Chicago said, well, you can't operate a gun range in the, in the city. This is part of a longer story. At Chicago, remember I mentioned Chicago is one of those places that had a ban on handguns. Uh, well, uh, the courts overturned that ban on handguns. They had to allow people to have handguns. And so what the city of Chicago did is says, okay, you can have handguns. But you have to register them first. You have to get registered. And to be eligible to register them, you have to do a certain amount of training with firearms. So you have to go to a gun range. And you have to do, I think it was two, two hours of certified training at the gun range before you can uh, be eligible to possess a firearm. And in the same law, they ban the operation of any gun range. So you could see why the federal courts probably aren't super happy with the, state of, uh, with the city of Chicago for this gun control effort. You can have a gun, but you've got to get training on a gun range, and we're not going to allow any gun ranges to operate in the city of Chicago. 
So it's effectively a ban on handguns. And so this has been an ongoing thing for the last four or five years where it goes up to the Seventh Circuit and gets struck down. But this is the kind of law that will get struck down, right? Uh, basically, the city of Chicago is, uh, uh, is uh, thumbing its nose, if you will, uh, at the federal courts and saying we're not going to allow people to have handguns very easily, and we're going to put a lot of barriers in the way. The courts have struck down, uh, struck down those laws. But other than straight-out bans on handguns, and uh, a couple of uh, sort of silly laws that are arising because of uh, sort of desperate efforts to keep people from having guns, uh, a few of these laws have been uh, overturned. What hasn't been overturned? Well, the courts have upheld bans on assault weapons. They've upheld uh, universal background checks. They've upheld uh, bans on high capacity magazines. Um, virtually the entirety of the current gun control movement's agenda has been upheld by the federal courts. The Supreme Court hasn't stepped back in too much. They had a 2010 case um, uh, that said the Second Amendment applied nationwide, not and to the states and local governments. But basically, the Supreme Court has stayed out of it, and the lower courts have upheld the vast majority of gun control laws. Um, it's notable that not only did the, has the Supreme Court not stepped in to review these laws, but has affirmatively decided uh, in several cases, not to even review them, not to even review these lower court decisions where certain forms of gun control laws uh, like assault weapons bans or high capacity magazine bans were upheld. Uh, and this is when Scalia was on the Supreme Court. Over the last few years before Justice Scalia died, the Supreme Court had an assault weapons ban brought to it. It had a high capacity magazine ban ca uh, case brought to it. And the Supreme Court in both those cases said we're not even going to review it. There weren't enough votes, there weren't four votes on the Supreme Court to overturn or to even consider overturning um, uh, lower court opinions upholding bans on uh, assault weapons, upholding bans on high capacity magazines. Um, as a result of that, where we are presently, and the presently is changing a little bit because we have a new Supreme Court nominee, Neil Gorsuch. Uh, I think Neil Gorsuch will likely be confirmed by uh, the United States Senate uh, at some point. Um, uh, and he is likely to be a strong supporter of the individual right to bear arms. Um, uh, and he is likely to rule similarly to Scalia on right to bear arms issues. Um, but even if he does so, it doesn't really change the dynamics, at least in the short term, on the United States Supreme Court uh, as it relates to gun control and the right to bear arms. Uh, even assuming he takes Scalia's seat, well, Scalia had filed, uh, Scalia was one of two justices who, along with Justice Thomas, had tried to get the, the, the justices to take an assault weapons ban case or a high capacity magazine ban case. And the court just re was not interested, just didn't have the votes. So even with Gorsuch replacing Scalia, it probably doesn't change the dynamics on gun rights and gun control in the Supreme Court right now. Um, uh, what the courts have done in, uh, or what the courts are doing today uh, in gun control cases is applying something what they call intermediate scrutiny. For the law students uh, uh, among, uh, among us or lawyers, uh, you're very familiar with that kind of terminology, the terminology of intermediate scrutiny. Uh, it's a test that courts apply when judging the constitutionality of certain kinds of laws, gun control laws uh, uh, for our purposes. And this intermediate scrutiny standard essentially allows the government wide leeway to regulate guns. And uh, uh, one way of thinking about it, uh, the courts don't use this terminology, but it's kind of a common terminology that's used in uh, discourse about guns and gun regulation, is that where there's reasonable regulation of guns, the courts will uphold those regulations. Okay, they don't phrase it in those terms, but that's essentially what we have. Now, ironically, it's Scalia's uh, opinion in the 2008 Heller case, because Justice Scalia had been the author of the 2008 Heller case. It was his opinion that led to so many of these gun control laws being upheld. Right? Many people thought, again, that this was a, an opinion that would lead to many gun laws being struck down. But there's a very important paragraph in Scalia's opinion in the Heller case where he says, Nothing in this opinion is intended to cast doubt on laws banning felons possessing firearms, on laws banning guns from sensitive places like schools and government buildings, or uh, commercial sale restrictions on guns. Think about maybe waiting periods or background checks 
Uh, the court suggested that those kinds of commercial restrictions on the sale of guns, um, uh, as a general matter, uh, do not, uh, or the court at least suggested, would not run afoul of the Second Amendment. Um, and that's an important paragraph. And, that, uh, and because of that paragraph, court after court has looked and said, ah, the court did not really mean the, second, the, the Heller case uh, to uh, lead to a gun control revolution where we start striking down gun control laws left and right. In fact, what they look at that paragraph and say the opposite. This suggests that the court um, does not wish that this right uh, run roughshod over various forms of, uh, over the vast majority of gun control laws in America. Now, uh, so some people might be surprised that uh, in an opinion from Justice Scalia, uh, we had this kind of out, this, uh, well, we don't mean to call into question all of these other gun control laws. Um, and it is a surprise coming from Scalia in some ways, because Scalia was not known as a justice who liked to compromise. And in fact, especially on his early years on the Supreme Court, um, it was reputed that justices uh, would not assign opinions to Justice Scalia if it was close, because Scalia was the kind of guy, he had his vision, and he was going to write his vision. And if you didn't agree with him, then, it's a, then he'll be in dissent. Uh, he doesn't mind being in dissent. Uh, he wanted to get it right. Um, and so there were early on a lot of claims that he wouldn't compromise uh, in writing his opinion. Well, I don't know whether the paragraph that we see in the Heller case was a compromise or not. I've heard from stories from clerks that have suggested that it might have been um, uh, a compromise to secure the vote of Justice Kennedy. We don't know really for sure. Um, but for whatever reason is, that paragraph is there. And what I wish to suggest as I turn my attention now to the past of gun control is that it's actually not a surprise that it's there, even though it came from the pen of Justice Scalia. Because if we look at the past of uh, gun rights and gun control, we see that we've always drawn that same kind of balance that the Heller case tried to balance. We've always recognized a right to bear arms uh, and protected people's ability to have guns for personal protection in their home, while at the same time giving wide leeway to government to regulate guns. Well, you might say, well, wait, Adam, that doesn't make sense. You just told us that 2008 was the first case where the Supreme Court held that the Second Amendment clearly protected a right to bear arms. How could it be that in the past, courts were balancing gun rights with gun control? It sounds like they weren't even recognizing gun rights. Well, if you look at only the Second Amendment, that would be right. But if you want to understand the right to bear arms in American law, you have to look beyond just the Second Amendment. So every state has its own state constitution. And those state constitutions, the state constitutions can provide additional rights that the federal constitution does not provide. Um, and so for, and currently 42, I think it's uh, maybe just up to 43, one state just uh, changed, I think Kansas just a couple years ago changed their constitutional provision. So maybe we're at 43 now. Um, 43 states have right to bear arms provisions in their state constitution. Many of these provisions date back from the 1800s when the states were first admitted to the Union. They wrote their constitutions, and one of the provisions they included was a right to keep and bear arms. Well, there's been a lot of debate, as you might know, over the Second Amendment, whether it protects an individual right to have a gun for your own personal protection, or whether it protects some kind of militia-based right, a, a right that's tied to participation in some collective militia self-defense effort, some national security um, um, vehicle. Um, well, um, that debate is very lively over the history of the Second Amendment, but that debate does not exist at all in the state constitutional law area. In state constitutional law, gun control laws have been subject to judicial review under state constitutional law uh, since the 1820s, the first state court cases on the right to bear arms under state constitutional law. So we have, uh, before Heller, a uh, hundred and, I don't know how many years that is, uh, but 170 years, 180 years of, uh, of case law on the right to bear arms before the court even interprets the Second Amendment to protect an individual right to bear arms under these state constitutional provisions. These state constitutional provisions are uniformly, I think there may be one exception in the state of Massachusetts, but uh, with one exception, uniformly read to protect an individual right to bear arms. No association with a militia, no association with uh, some kind of national defense force like the National Guard. It's always been an individual right to bear arms. And you have cases going back to the 1820s saying that these provisions are individual right to bear arms uh, for personal protection. 
Um, and so uh, if you go back to the 1820s and look at all these cases, there's been hundreds of cases on the constitutionality of gun control over the course of American history. And by and large, the courts do exactly what they're doing now under the Second Amendment. They recognize an individual right, but uphold reasonable regulations on that right. And generally say, so long as you don't completely destroy the right to bear arms, completely deny people the right, then regulations on that right are constitutionally permissible. One of the things that's interesting is when we think about that uniformity, that uniformity comes in a world in which on the subject of guns there is so little uniformity. Right? You have conservative states and liberal states applying the same standard. Uh, you have conservative states uh, where they say the right to bear arms is a fundamental right, but yet they uphold reasonable regulation. And you have liberal states that say, yes, that you do have an individual right to bear arms and, uh, uh, and will uphold uh, a gun control law if it's reasonable regulation. So despite great differences in geography, in demographics, in political leanings, um, the state constitutional law was actually very uniform and consistent. You had a right to bear arms, but reasonable regulation uh, will survive. The fact that, that these cases exist right, uh, is itself uh, an important reminder about the past of gun rights and gun control, which is that today we're often told that gun rights, uh, that, sorry, that gun control is a modern 20th century invention, something recently devised by liberals to try to uh, disarm the people and render them powerless, when the truth of the matter is far more complicated. It, the founding fathers had gun control laws, and Americans have had gun control laws for as long as we've had America. Now, these laws have changed a lot over the years, and frankly, the founders didn't call it gun control, but they regulated guns, tried to prohibit people from having guns if they thought those people were untrustworthy. In some cases, this was a very disturbing reflection of uh, the framers' ideas of who counts as untrustworthy. Uh, they thought that African Americans uh, were untrustworthy. So if you were black, whether slave or free, you could not own a gun. But it wasn't just about race and racism, although of course that plays an important part of the story. It was also, uh, during the Revolutionary Era, loyalists were not allowed to possess firearms. They could be dispossessed of their firearms. Um, uh, loyalists were people who, swore an oath of, who refused to swear an oath of loyalty to the new country. We're not talking about traitors. I'm not talking about people who in America were taking up arms fighting against the revolution. We're talking about people who were in America uh, and who just thought that the war was a mistake and thought that actually we should remain loyal to England. I know it's hard to believe today that anyone in America could have ever been opposed to revolution and independence. But historians uh, know that it's about 40% of Americans uh, thought that the revolution was a mistake and would lead to uh, uh, a much worse situation for the colonies uh, than revolution. Um, uh, or that revolution would lead to a much worse situation for the colonies. Um, Americans have been divided on these issues ever since uh, the get-go. Right? So, um, uh, so the framers had gun control laws. They banned people who they thought were untrustworthy from possessing firearms. We should never use those same categories of untrustworthiness, but today we focus on things like felons, uh, who we think are untrustworthy with guns. They, they can't be trusted, so we don't want them to have guns. Or we focus on people who have adjudicated mental illness. And we say, you know what? If you, if, you're, if you have adjudicated mental illness, we'll keep you from having a gun. We don't trust you to possess a firearm and to use it safely. Um, so that same idea of trustworthiness continues to shape gun control, um, even though uh, it's a much older uh, idea. And it wasn't just gun bans. You had laws like in Boston in the founding era that prohibited the possession in your home of any loaded firearm. There were also restrictions on how you could store gunpowder. Now, the concern here was not exactly the same concern that we might have today with loaded guns. Back then in the day, gunpowder was very combustible. I guess it's still very combustible. Um, but you'd store it in a big, you know, in a big uh, barrel. Uh, where it's uh, far more combustible than it is when it's already packaged in a, uh, in a projectile. Um, and so uh, you had laws like the laws in Boston that prohibited the possession of any loaded weapon in any house, warehouse, place of business, or otherwise. You just couldn't have a loaded gun on you in Boston waiting for you to, defend, uh, to be used for defense against criminals. 
If we think, go back, if we go through American history, we find that under almost every turn where we see the heart of America's gun culture, we also find stories of gun control. The Wild West, right? No place better represents that myth of American culture than the Wild West. And you sort of have that image in your mind of, uh, you know, the cowboys walking through town, they got six shooter on each hip, they got, you know, a rifle strapped across their chest, maybe a th big thing of all the uh, ammunition they have, maybe a little Derringer pistol in the sock. They're so loaded down with iron, it's amazing a horse could bring them anywhere, right? <laughs> so that's our idea of the Wild West. But in truth, there's nothing could be more different than how the Wild West actually was. That while it's true that a lot of people had guns in the Wild West, you're out in the frontier going from place to place, there was no law, you needed something to defend yourself against wild animals, outlaws, or whatnot. People had guns in the Wild West, that's for sure. But when you went into a frontier town where people lived in the Wild West, places like Dodge City or Tombstone, Arizona, Carson City, Nevada, these places, these frontier towns, all had the most restrictive gun control laws in the nation, precisely because everyone out in the Wild West had guns. So what these, these towns typically did, uh, when Dodge City formed its municipal government in 1872, you know what the very first law they passed was? Municipal Ordinance Number 1 was a ban on carrying concealed firearms uh, in Dodge City. Uh, a couple years later, that law was expanded to ban uh, open carry of firearms, too. So Dodge City, the famous rust, cow rustling town of the Wild West, where we even say, oh, I had to get out of Dodge. It turns out you actually didn't have to get out of Dodge. Like there, <laughs> People weren't allowed to carry their guns in Dodge. People had guns in their homes, or uh, what you'd have to do if you were a visitor when you came to like Tombstone, Arizona, uh, the, uh, the home of the famous shootout at the OK Corral, the famous, uh, you know, the Wyatt Earp and his brothers, and uh, the Clanton and McClary's on the other side, and they meet on the street uh, in Tombstone, Arizona, and they have this shootout, and it's been memorialized in movies and television and books, and uh, songs uh, everywhere, right? this famous, famous story that sort of in some ways encapsulates what the Wild West must have been like, right? walking down the street, gunfights. Turns out in Tombstone, when you went to Tombstone, Arizona in the 1880s when the shootout of the OK Corral occurred, you were required to check your guns with the local marshal. Or you could have the option of leaving your guns at the stable with your horses. So you can keep it with your stuff back at the stable, or you could check your gun and you get like a little token so that you could get your gun back from the sheriff when you left. But you were not allowed to carry that gun through the city of Tombstone. And indeed, the shootout at the OK Corral was itself a confrontation over gun control. The Clantons and McClaries refused to obey the law that prohibited them from carrying guns in Tombstone. And that was, while there were other sources of the problem too, it wasn't just that, but what led to the, the actual conflict that day was that uh, the Earps, the Earp brothers, and the Marshals said, you know what? We are going to go and enforce this law. They are not allowed to walk around our, city, our town with their guns on their hips. So they went and had this shootout precisely because they were enforcing a gun control law. Right? So if we think about even something like the shootout at the OK Corral in the heart of America's gun culture, it's actually really a story of gun control not just a story of gun rights uh, and uh, uh, how important guns are to America. And indeed, uh, gun control, uh, uh, I, as I argue in my book, gunfight uh, has been a long-standing feature of American gun culture. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, has suffered from some of the same defects that American culture has suffered from. So American culture has obviously suffered from the defect of racism and discrimination. And American gun culture has suffered from that too. So we have this long history of gun control laws. Often those gun control laws were designed for public safety reasons, right? To keep the untrustworthy from having guns or to prevent people from walking around towns like in the Wild West with their guns uh, on their hips. But at the same time, there have often been racist motivations for gun control. One of the reasons, one of the ways in which you keep uh, an oppressed and subjugated people uh, as second class citizens is by denying them the ability to fight to become first class citizens. And so over the course of American history, there's actually a long thread of racially discriminatory gun control laws. I've already mentioned that the founding fathers had gun control laws and they had racially discriminatory ones. They banned blacks 
uh, both slave and free from possessing firearms. But they're not alone in that. Um, uh, that uh, has shaped gun policy um, for much of American history. The KKK, when it started, one of its big agenda items was gun control. Uh, and the reason why was because many Southern blacks had, had uh, taken up arms during the war by serving in the Union Army and then returning to the South with their guns. The Union Army, by the way, let the soldiers at the time keep their guns when they went home. Um, and so uh, soldiers took their guns home with them. Uh, and uh, um, especially if you were returning to the South, think about it. You're an escaped slave who's now won your freedom. Um, your, your, something drives you to go back to the hometown that you came from, probably because you had never been anywhere else in your life until you decided to join the war. Your family's there, your loves are there, your kids are there, your family, whatever, whoever is there that brings you back, but you come back with a gun because you know who else is waiting for you when you get there, which is the racist white people who are going to try to hurt you, uh, as they always had. Right? And so the KKK arises after the Civil War as uh, these posses that go out at night to wreak havoc in black communities. But they had a very specific goal. Obviously, the larger goal was to intimidate and to cause fear and to create second, uh, you know, recreate a white, uh, white supremacy. One of the strategies for doing it, and the reason why they were out at night in those uniforms, was because they were going out to collect the guns. They wanted to go into black homes, collect all the guns. And in fact, you can read great transcripts of reports of investigations into the Ku Klux Klan in the 1870s. And uh, it's all about that's what they were doing at night. They were going out to collect the guns. Um, uh, in the 1920s and the 1930s, the NRA, the National Rifle Association, today known as the biggest defender of gun rights uh, in America, um, uh, was an advocate of gun control laws. In the 1920s and the 1930s, the NRA pushed for laws to restrict who could carry guns on the streets of America's cities, uh, pushed for special permitting laws that didn't allow people to carry guns uh, unless they had a special need, something unique, like they were, you know, for us, you might think of you were being stalked or you carried a lot of money around or something like that. Um, that was uh, the idea uh, um, uh, behind um, uh, uh, the NRA supported laws. Well, why did the NRA support these laws? Well, uh, most historians who've looked at this area say, well, at least one of the reasons was racism. That promiscuous toting of guns was something that was thought to be common among Southern European immigrants. Early 1900s uh, saw waves of immigrants from Southern Europe, Italy, uh, Spain, etc., cetera. Uh, and uh, they were thought to be um, more likely to tote guns around. So these laws didn't designed to prevent them from carrying guns. These laws were designed in part to prevent them from carrying guns or to make it harder for them uh, to carry guns. And then in the 1960s, we uh, take us to the 1960s, uh, it was the efforts of black radicals like the Black Panthers, Malcolm X, to take the civil rights movement uh, and make it an armed civil rights movement um, uh, 10 years after Martin Luther King's um, uh, peaceful nonviolence approach uh, still had yet to uh, lead to significant reforms in black communities, led people like Malcolm X and the Black Panthers to say, we're taking up arms to defend our freedom. And those laws, uh, the Black Panthers, or those actions, the Black Panthers taking up arms and invading the California State House in Sacramento in 1968, the riots, uh, the race riots uh, in the, that same summer, um, uh, led to a whole new round of gun control laws. Uh, both at the state and federal level. Uh, and these were, I think, designed, at least in part, with racist motivations. It's not the entirety of the story. There were many people who wanted to, do the, to re regulate guns to restrict, uh, to, to enhance public safety, but there was also a, a racial uh, dimension to this. Um, and indeed, one of the things I found, surprising things I found in my book is that, when I'm doing my research, is that the Black Panthers actually are the forerunners of the modern gun rights movement. <coughs> Before the 1960s, the NRA did not talk about the Second Amendment as protecting the right to bear arms. In fact, uh, I mentioned the NRA in the 1920s and 1930s. The head of the NRA, the president of the NRA, was asked to testify before Congress in 1932 when Congress was debating the first major federal gun control law, uh, the National Firearms Act. And the head of the NRA was asked, was called in to testify, uh, and was asked, um, uh, do you believe the Second Amendment imposes any restriction on what the federal government can do when it regulates guns? And his answer was, 
I have never given it much study from that perspective. Elsewhere, that same gentleman, Carl Frederick, he was an Olympic shooter. Um, uh, he, uh, elsewhere, he wrote very specifically that protection for, gun, for, for uh, protection for people's ability to own guns is not found in the Second Amendment. It's found in wise public policy. If you go through the NRA's signature magazine, their signature publication, The American Rifleman, that everyone who's an NRA member gets a copy of this uh, monthly magazine, um, you can go back through the issues as I have. You can go right there in the library. I'm sure you can go to look through uh, stacks of the issues here in the library um, from the 1930s and the 1940s and the 1950s up until the mid-60s. And you just look at every page and you don't see the Second Amendment. You can't find it mentioned anywhere in there. You read that same magazine today, and I guarantee you the Second Amendment will be mentioned on at least every other page. And I'm going to say a higher rate than that. Right? So there's a big shift that happens in the Second Amendment, how we think about the Second And the Black Panthers played an important role in this, because the Black Panthers were among the first to say, hey, we are going to take up arms. Not, and that the NRA had long said, well, um, to the extent that we think that people should protect gun rights, it wasn't founded in the Second Amendment, but they said we thought that people, generally thought that people should be able to have a handgun in their home for personal protection, because the, police, the same argument here today, you know, when, uh, when there's an emergency, the police are only minutes away. You know, when, there's, when your life is, has seconds to spare, uh, the police are only minutes away. And they had long uh, promoted the view that people did have, should have the ability to have a gun in their home for personal protection. What changed was uh, after the Black Panthers. The Black Panthers said, hey, you don't just need a gun for personal protection in your home. The Black Panthers, the fear that they had was of police abuse out on the street. So they said, you should be able to have guns to fight uh, against the dangers that are in the public space, not just in the private home. And not only that, but the danger that you need to protect against in the public streets um, was the danger of government oppression and government tyranny. Now, from the perspective of the Black Panthers, that makes a lot of sense, right? Because the, the officers of the government they were used to dealing with were police officers who were decidedly hostile to the rights of African Americans in places like Oakland, where uh, the Black Panthers were found, uh, founded just down the block. Um, uh, so they articulated this new view of the Second Amendment that emphasized uh, the right of revolution, the right to fight against government tyranny, take up arms against the government, and also argued for moving uh, the right to bear arms outside of the home and into the public space. Um, and those two moves were really very influential and fundamentally ended up changing the gun debate uh, for, uh, in America. Um, and although the NRA was not quick to take on the, end, the, the arguments of the Black Panthers, uh, over time, those arguments seeped into the NRA's own view about how to think about gun violence. And ironically, Efforts to disarm urban black Marxist-leaning radicals like the Black Panthers help lead to a backlash among white, rural, predominantly southern conservatives to favor the right to bear arms. Many people thought, hey, the government is going to come get our guns next. Um, now, given this history of race and racism, uh, 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 in gun control and in shaping gun policy, I think it's important and it behooves courts when adjudicating the constitutionality of gun control laws to at least be cognizant of that history. I don't think it means that you can't have good gun control laws or that courts should be skeptical of every gun control law. I think that would be the wrong lesson to take from it. Gun law, like every other area of law in America, was tainted by race and racism. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have gun control laws. I mean, our property laws were tainted by race and racism, but we don't get rid of property laws because of that. We just try to get rid of the racist parts. Our voting laws, uh, historically, racially discriminatory. Does that mean we shouldn't have any voting laws? Well, we could probably use a few less voting laws. I'll agree with that. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't have any voting laws. Maybe we should be, when we see a voting restriction come up, we should take that history of racial discrimination seriously and say, OK, well, when, when you pass this law, I'm at least going to remember that this has been done before for discriminatory purposes, so we can at least factor that into the analysis. Um, of course, marriage laws have been discriminatory, racially discriminatory. We don't get rid of marriage laws because they've been discriminatory. And we shouldn't get rid of gun control 
because there is uh, a history that's tied in with race and race discrimination. Um, today, in fact, it's important to note that gun control is supported most vigorously by racial minorities and uh, ethnic groups that would be uh, the targets of discrimination, more likely, rather than the powerful forces. So if we look at uh, some of the growing, the changing demographics of America, one of the challenges for the NRA in the long term is going to be how do you maintain that constituency when uh, the core ownership, uh, the core group demographic that owns guns is getting smaller relatively. Um, white, male, uh, uh, mostly rural, not college educated. Uh, that's the main spring of the demographic. Again, that's a demographic. I don't mean to suggest everyone who owns a gun fits in one of those categories. It's just that's their main, uh, the main well of support for gun rights. And in contrast, um, the growing areas of the population, uh, racial minorities, uh, Latinos, um, college educated, urban dwellers, all of those things are associated with support, higher support for gun control. So that's one of the big challenges uh, going forward uh, is that uh, today gun control laws are not racist and indeed they're supported by racial minorities uh, and people who have historically been subject to discrimination uh, and as those populations get bigger they're likely to support gun control more forcefully uh, than uh, previous uh, than the current uh, um, demographic. So that turns our attention now I think is a nice segue to the future of uh, gun rights and the future of uh, the Second uh, Amendment. Uh, when we think about those demographic factors and whatnot, um, it, takes a, it turns our attention to the future. And I want to think about the future. I want to divide it into two categories, short term and long term. So short term, I think there are a couple of interesting issues that are arising in the gun world, uh, but they're not likely to, be, uh, to lead to significant shifts in gun policy uh, or in uh, the Supreme Court jurisprudence of the right to bear arms. As I've mentioned, I don't think we're going to see a significant shift in the Supreme Court from the Gorsuch uh, nomination. Um, uh, surprisingly, I think that we might have seen more change in this regard had um, President Clinton won the election. Um, if President Clinton had won the election, Merrick Garland or someone more liberal would have been uh, likely appointed to the United States Supreme Court or at least nominated to the Supreme Court. Um, and uh, uh, Judge Garland might be a vote to overturn the Heller case and might really change how uh, gun dynamics are, uh, are uh, done or how they play out in any particular moment. I think with Gorsuch what we have is probably a continuation of the current equilibrium. Yes, you have a right to bear arms. You can't completely ban people from having handguns in the home. But other than that, we're pretty much going to give government wide leeway to regulate firearms. Two major issues that the court's going to have to weigh in on that will shape gun policy. One is there a right to carry a gun in public. The Supreme Court has never decided that question. As I mentioned earlier, uh, or I mentioned earlier, some of the gun control laws that the court has refused to uh, review uh, among those have been also laws that are, provide for discretionary permitting of uh, concealed carry. So if you want to carry a gun on the street, um, uh, there's two different kinds of licensing schemes you have out there. It's actually three, I guess you should say. There's three different potential licensing schemes out there for people who want to carry guns on the street. There's what we have here in California, what you have here in, San, in Berkeley and in Oakland and San Francisco, which is basically no one gets a gun to carry on the street. That's not how it's phrased. It's called May Issue Permitting. It's discretionary, and it basically says that you have to go to the local um, uh, chief of police, or in, in California, it's the sheriff. You go to the local sheriff, uh, and you apply for a permit, and you have to show that you've got some special need to carry a gun. This is basically the NRA's 1920s, 1930s gun reform still exists here in California. Right? And, and the sheriff is, has discretion about whether he gives you the gun or not. And if you can show that, hey, I'm being stalked by my old boyfriend and he's made violent threats, they're likely to give you a permit. If you're a guard and carry a lot of money with you, they're likely to give you a permit because you have that justifiable need. But otherwise, you're not going to get a permit. You're not going to be able to get a permit just by saying, ah, I fear that someone might threaten me. Not good enough. Um, uh, so. Um, uh, the court has, so there have been court opinions that have upheld discretionary permitting in places like California and in Maryland and in New York, and the Supreme Court refused to step in 
and to overturn those laws. Um, I think that uh, eventually this issue should come to the Supreme Court in one shape, way, shape, or form, and the court should eventually rule on it. Um, currently, every court of appeals has upheld discretionary permitting. Every court of appeals to rule on the issue has upheld discretionary permitting. Eventually, you might predict that there'll be a split in the circuits and that one circuit will go the other way, in which case the Supreme Court will have to take a case to provide some uniformity so that there's not these two different views uh, out, out there. Um, uh, and, uh, but even here, I'm doubtful that the Supreme Court is going to call into question discretionary permitting. And why is this? Well, it's a total realpolitik explanation. I think the justices uh, walk down the street in Washington, D.C., and they don't want people promiscuously toting guns around Washington, D.C., where they live. Um, and so I think that that's probably going to have a profound effect on how those, how those cases come out. But eventually, the court's going to have to decide, does the right to bear arm extend outside the home? A second issue, it's a really interesting issue that's not going to get a lot of public attention, but I think for those of us in the gun world, very, very interesting, is what is the status of as-applied challenges to broad bans on the possession of firearms? So current law says that if you have a felony conviction, um, you cannot possess a firearm under federal law uh, for life. Until you get, if you got your rights restored, then you can, but there's no process in federal, under the federal uh, administration, under the federal bureaucracy, to have those rights restored. So effectively, you have this lifetime ban on possession of firearms if you have a felony conviction. Well, there's a whole bunch of interesting cases being brought up, uh, being, coming, coming, uh, being brought in the lower courts that are known as as-applied challenges. This is where someone says, okay, I'm not going to challenge whether it's constitutional to ban felons from possessing firearms. We're going to assume that it's constitutional to ban felons from possessing firearms. And indeed, that's a wise concession because every court that's ruled on it has said felons can be prohibited from possessing firearms. Um, but what these arguments are instead, this per person comes in and says, okay, yeah, the general law is constitutional, but it's unconstitutional as applied to me because my felony conviction is 25 years ago. And it wasn't a violent felony. And I've got a nice, clean record ever since. And courts have started to uh, say that, yes, people can bring these kinds of as-applied challenges. And if, this, if more courts say that you can bring these as-applied challenges, you could imagine a lot of cases coming to the federal courts where individuals say, oh, my gun conviction's 10 years old. I want a hearing on the merits, whether I can get my gun rights back. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, uh, my conviction is 12 years old. My conviction is 8 years old. My conviction is 20 years old, but for a violent crime. But it was 20 years ago. Right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of calculations that courts are going to have to make uh, to determine whether someone can uh, possess a firearm, even though they're subject to a categorical rule under federal law that says no firearms. So that's a really interesting short-term issue that's going to come up. Long-term issue, I want to suggest in my last uh, five, seven minutes, um, that what we're likely to see is the increasing irrelevance of the Second Amendment. Uh, Professor Zimmering, uh, in his terrific introduction, it was terrific because of all the nice things it said about me, of course, um, but in his terrific in, uh, introduction, he said that the Second Amendment has become so important as a question for shaping policy. I think, actually, what we might see in the future is that the Second Amendment will become effectively irrelevant in constitutional litigation. Now, what do I mean by that? So, well, I don't mean to suggest that the Second Amendment is going to be overturned anytime soon. No, that's not going to happen. It's still going to be part of the Constitution. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I certainly uh, uh, don't mean to say that, um, uh, that, uh, 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 that it's not going to be part of the Constitution, but it's going to be irrelevant because it's not going to have any impact on gun policy. Now, I should say one other thing. I don't mean to suggest that it won't still be used as a rhetorical tool, where someone says, ah, I've got Second Amendment rights. That's a powerful rhetorical tool to use in political debate, and I'm sure it will still be used in 2030, the Second Amendment, as a, that rhetorical tool. But why would it be irrelevant? Well, it would be irrelevant because it wouldn't do what a constitutional right is designed to do. That is to say, to sort unconstitutional laws from constitutional laws. That's where the rubber hits the road. It's not that you have a right of free speech. What the First Amendment's real meaning is, is that government can stop you from uh, shouting fire in a crowded theater, but can't stop you from spending a million dollars to elect your favorite candidate. 
right? It's, it's that sorting process that the First Amendment really becomes uh, lively. That's where the rubber hits the road for constitutional, uh, constitutional rights, that sorting process. Well, I think that that sorting process has become less relevant. It'll, it won't do that role. Well, one possible, one, how might this happen? Well, I think there's two different scenarios. One scenario is that liberals retake the Supreme Court over time. Uh, between now and 2030, that's certainly possible. Um, uh, it seemed like it was about to happen this year. Um, uh, so it's possible that liberals might retake the Supreme Court at some point and overturn the Heller case. And if they overturn the Heller case, uh, then, and say there's no individual right to bear arms protected by the Second Amendment, obviously the Second Amendment will become less relevant for how we determine gun policy. It won't do any sorting of what's constitutional and not constitutional because it won't really have anything to say about gun control. But that's the easy way in which it might become uh, irrelevant. Um, I think that uh, it, it might well become uh, uh, irrelevant because the gun debate will outpace and outstrip Second Amendment jurisprudence. If we wanted to think about this graphically, we might say that um, uh, const let me get a pen that works. A constitutional right um, sets a floor. If I do enough of these pens, one of them will either have color or all the colors together will add up. No, that one's erasing it. OK. I'm just going to try one more. Uh, okay, so constitutional rights set a floor. Right? It's not really an even floor. It might be more like a mountainous mountain range, right? Uh, but it basically sets a floor, and uh, lawmakers can't pass laws in here because this stuff is all unconstitutional. So if Heller case sets this, you know, here's a ban on handguns in the home, and maybe here's that. Uh, 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 that Chicago ban on gun ranges after they've required you to use a gun range before you can possess a firearm. Um, that stuff is all down here. Increasingly, however, what we're finding is that the gun debate is deba in American politics is choosing between two options that are far above this mountain range or far above this floor. Right? So uh, we have uh, uh, the courts have suggested, uh, for instance, that it's constitutionally permissible to have this May issue permitting, like places like California, uh, California have. Right? But uh, 40 states now have gotten rid of May issue permitting. They now have what they call shall issue permitting, which is over the last 40 years, the NRA has pushed state after state after state to pass laws allowing people, and basically any law-abiding person, to carry a gun on the street. If you, you go get a permit, you can carry that gun on the street. That's the law of most states. Um, California's law may be uh, effectively overturned in the next 12 months. There is a proposal by the NRA for a law called national reciprocity. Um, they're going to sell this idea of national reciprocity as being about protecting a tourist from Utah who wants to come to California. And if that tourist from Utah who has a permit to carry a gun in Utah comes on vacation to Berkeley, well, they should be allowed to carry their gun uh, too uh, when they come to Berkeley. Maybe the people in Berkeley don't like that idea, uh, but at least that's how the, the pitch will go, that someone shouldn't be discriminated against when they go across state lines uh, just because they want to use their guns uh, or carry their guns. Um, uh, uh, but that said, um, uh, oh, so there's this federal law, national reciprocity, but some iterations of uh, the national reciprocity law only apply to tourists like that. But then there are other uh, iterations, including some that have been the basis of proposals in Congress that have been made over the last month, that would allow a California resident to carry a gun in California, so someone who lives in Berkeley could carry a gun in Berkeley if they can get an out-of-state permit. So Utah, it turns out, doesn't require you to be a resident of Utah to get a concealed carry permit there. So you, California resident can file and get a Utah concealed carry permit. And under some iterations of the national reciprocity, you would then be allowed with that Utah permit to carry a gun in your own hometown of Berkeley. Now, if this law gets passed, well, then the discretionary permitting laws of places like California will be rendered irrelevant. Right? Because now anyone who wants to get a firearm can get, and wants to carry a gun on the street can get their permit from Utah and they don't have discretionary permit. So what we're seeing is, is that, uh, yes, the court has said that discretionary permitting is constitutionally permissible. 
but in the next year we may not have any real effective discretionary permitting anymore. We'll have, the debate is happening up here about whether we're going to have shall issue permitting and what extent that's going to be. Another example is when we talk about public carry of firearms, there's a move among several states for what they're calling constitutional carry, but what really should be called permitless carry. People allowed to carry a firearm on the streets with no permit whatsoever. You don't have to apply. Right, so the debate right now over carrying guns in public is at least largely uh, a question of whether we're going to have permitless carry or shall issue carry. And the discretionary permitting down here is becoming uh, uh, just less relevant for gun policy. And I think increasingly as we're seeing this divide among the states, where some states like California are becoming more liberal, more adding more gun control laws to the books, most states are going the opposite direction, becoming more permissive with regards to guns, allowing guns in churches or college campuses or bars or restaurants, uh, public transportation, um, uh, the guns everywhere law of Georgia being a good example of sort of uh, the future of how these laws might work. The laws that are being enacted at the, uh, uh, in all of these states are all up here. None of them are down here. They're, none of them are near even the border of what's constitutional or not constitutional. Um, so as a result, the Constitution's not going to have much of a say over whether we have policy A or policy B. Right? The Constitution might help us if we're saying between policy C and policy D. Right? Oh, D is under the line. That's unconstitutional. But increasingly, we're going to see the Second Amendment become less relevant in doing that fundamental task of sorting good gun control or permissible gun control laws from impermissible uh, gun control laws. Um, uh, and so uh, with that, I, I want to end it there and have some time for uh, Q&A. Yeah? Uh, given that your chart is up there, I'm confused about one thing. Where you talk about the floor, if the discussion between permissible open carry and not open carry, Well, it doesn't push the floor. The floor is set by the constitutional jurisprudence. So it doesn't push the floor up. The floor doesn't change. It doesn't even raise a constitutional issue. It doesn't even get to court. And can you summarize just for the recording? Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. So uh, the question is, if, if I understand the question right, is uh, doesn't this constitutional floor that I'm talking about move up as the debate moves up in some ways? As you get all these states adopting certain policies, won't this floor move up? If it comes before the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court then says it's okay, open carry for everybody in the country is okay, that changes the floor. Well, again, with the Supreme Court, the way the Supreme Court works is they don't get, um, a case doesn't come to them where they get to say, is it okay for people to have open carry or not? So what you have to have is a law that goes into place, and then someone challenges that law as a violation of a constitutional right. It's hard to imagine how you would challenge a, a law allowing people to carry their guns openly would be seen as a violation of the Second Amendment right to bear arms. Now, you might not like the law for a whole bunch of other reasons, policy reasons or whatnot, but not because it violates the right to bear arms. Right? There's no requirement. Uh, that the court even reach that issue, right? And in fact, the court will not reach the issue. Um, what, when states are passing, if the state, for instance, if the Supreme Court says well, you can, uh, uh, that may issue permitting is constitutionally permissible, states don't have to have may issue permitting. As I said earlier, state constitutions, for instance, can provide additional protections for rights. They just can't go below what the Supreme Court offers, right? And so if you want to provide additional protection, provide Oh, well, you can get a gun. If you're a lawful, uh, lawful, a law-abiding person, you can get a gun and carry it on, on the public streets. That's fine. No permit necessary. That doesn't raise a Second Amendment issue. Right? No one could make a reasonable, plausible claim that that violates the right to bear arms. Again, it might violate other rights. It might violate other concerns that you have. It might be a terrible policy. But it doesn't violate the right to bear arms. In the back, yeah. Congress's overthrow of the assault weapons ban that had been introduced in 
introduced by Senator Feinstein? Again, there is nothing for the court to rule on in that issue. Okay, you have to have a law, and then you say, does that law violate a provision of the Constitution? Here you have no law. You have uh, a law that was once in effect that is no longer in effect. A law that is not in effect cannot violate any constitutional right. So the Supreme Court's never had any occasion to review it and would not have any occasion to review it. So uh, that's again what, and I think this sort of goes to the larger point. Um, to, at least to a certain extent, the Second Amendment is already well on its way to becoming irrelevant. It's not addressing these questions like open carry or whether Congress has to have an assault weapons ban or something like that. The issue of gun, the gun debate is happening up here, not happening along this line. If we looked at campaign finance law, it would be totally different. The campaign finance law debates are all around here about what's constitutional and what's not. Here, the gun debate, because of the power of the NRA and the gun rights movement, They've pushed this debate, so now what we're talking about is a series of issues that aren't covered by the Constitution and are not likely to ever be ruled to be covered by the Constitution. Yeah? Right, where, yeah, where. I'll have to think about my graphing here. So the question is, what is the sort of the connection between campaign finance law and the future of the NRA? And I think it's pretty clear that campaign finance or campaign finance system is becoming increasingly deregulated, increasingly uh, sort of like the old Wild West. Anyone could sort of uh, do whatever they want out in the wilderness. Um, a lot of people are trying to make it more like the frontier towns with more restrictions, uh, but they don't seem to be working with the Supreme Court these days. Um, and as a result, it does empower outside groups that are very wealthy, like the NRA, to play an even more influential role in American politics. Um, the NRA has taken advantage of uh, the, these campaign finance rulings that allow independent expenditures uh, without uh, disclosure, uh, have, uh, uh, and, and have used those, uh, uh, that, that, uh, those opportunities uh, to advance candidates uh, for elective office. The real question, I think, in part, though, is whether the gun control community will be able to fight back. We have seen a reinvigoration of the gun control community in America and the gun, uh, the gun control movement. Uh, and when my book came out in 2011, uh, I was convinced that the gun control movement was pretty moribund at that point. And there were a lot of people who, uh, who wrote on the gun control movement as being moribund. That changed in December of 2012. That was when Newtown happened, and Newtown changed the gun debate radically in America. People often say to me, Newtown didn't change anything. We got no new federal laws since Newtown. That's right, no new federal laws since Newtown. Yet Newtown changed everything. Um, there is now a vibrant, thriving gun control movement. There is money in the gun control movement today that there wasn't before. Uh, previously, the Brady Center was the biggest gun control advocacy group out there, and it was famous for being pretty poorly financed. They couldn't run those kinds of ads that the NRA was able to fund because they just didn't have that kind of money. But now you have Mike Bloomberg money. You have Gabrielle Giffords has formed a super PAC to be able to fight for gun control. And what we're seeing is in several races, we've seen gun control supporters outspend the NRA, such as in Washington's uh, state referendum on whether to have universal background checks. You have gun control groups outspending the NRA on some races. Now, uh, the terrain is not even close to being equal between gun control groups and the NRA. I don't mean to suggest that it's equal, uh, but I do suggest that the gun control movement has become more active and is itself trying to use some of those opportunities, like the super PAC, a loophole created by Citizens United uh, and subsequent cases, um, to become more active in the debate. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So this the issue has come up. It's come up in both. The, uh, so the question is um, uh, from someone from who comes out. The question from a reproductive rights standpoint: um, How do courts handle uh, in the gun context the fact that you might limit the geographic availability of something that you need to exercise a right? 
Right? We see this in the reproductive rights community because state after state is limiting, uh, is passing laws making it hard to operate and run abortion clinics. Uh, and uh, as a result, you have states uh, in which there is, like Mississippi, only a single abortion clinic. Or in South Dakota, where the abortion clinic is only open, I think, once a month, once every other week. I don't remember what the schedule is now. Um, but they only have one clinic that's not even open every day. Um, uh, so there's been a big push. And one of the defenses that has been made in those cases, and Texas made this argument very specifically in the Supreme Court in a case last year, said, oh, it's OK that we're banning people from uh, effectively uh, stopping people from accessing abortion, because they can go across the, across the state to New, to New Mexico and get their uh, abortion. The court did not, in that case, rule on that specific argument. But the courts have never been friendly to that argument. Because if, what, if you think about it, it basically suggests, yes, you have a constitutional right, just not here in my town. That's not how the Constitution works. You have your constitutional rights in every town. Um, and the same argument that fails in the context of uh, abortion in this context will fail, I think, in the context of guns to forcing people. And I do think that there's actually one of the things I found really fascinating in thinking about guns and gun regulation is the overlap and similarities with the ways in which we, try to, we have tried to regulate abortion in this country. Uh, the only two rights that have waiting periods are guns and abortion. Um, we have, in the context of uh, abortion, a lot of silly and ridiculous laws that are being adopted that really seem only motivated by the desire to limit people's exercise of their fundamental right. Um, uh, if you talk to people in the gun community, especially here in California, they'll tell you that's exactly what's happened in the gun context of guns. That California just passes law after law, not really designed to help anyone, but designed because they want to make it difficult to exercise this fundamental right. Now, I'm not saying that they're right necessarily in their point, but we see, a very, we see similar kinds of argumentative frames in the context of both guns and reproductive rights. Uh, and sometimes, uh, when I, one of the things I did when I was writing my book, Gunfight, because you can tell, I'm, I'm a pretty liberal guy. Uh, I didn't grow up with guns. I grew up in a Hollywood family. We didn't even have squirt guns when I was a kid. <laughs> if I brought home one of those cap guns that made those bang sound, oh, forget it. I was grounded for a week. There were no guns in my house, right? So I don't come at this issue because I'm really interested in guns. I'm really interested in the constitutional issues and the historical issues. And one of the things I did when I was writing my book is I'd often say, um, OK, here's a gun control law. If this same law were effectively translated into the reproductive rights context, would I support it? And I often found myself saying, no, I would not support that. No, I don't mean to make a draw. It's not a straight equivalency between these two areas of law. They're different. I, I don't want to draw a straight equivalency. But I, I think it is helpful in terms of thinking about how we regulate rights to take these different rights. I mean, they're both very hotly contested. And I think there's some interesting comparisons that you can make and uh, uh, draw across those lines. Yeah, and the white shirt right up here. Yeah, so there's a strict push towards sanctuary cities now. So let's say we have this, um, to draw an analogy, if this Utah idea passed, where you know, Utah permit could be recognized in California, could the California just say we're not going to recognize that law? No, they couldn't say that. So the reason why we have sanctuary cities, what's going on there is that the Supreme Court has held that while the federal government is supreme over the states, that the federal government does not have the constitutional power to force state office holders to enforce federal law. The federal government wants to come in. So what that means is the federal government does not have the power to force, say, uh, Oakland PD uh, to enforce uh, the uh, the immigration laws. They just don't have that power to force them, right? So, um, uh, so that's how we get these sanctuary cities. People just, re state office holders refuse to follow a federal law. And the federal government can't make them follow the law. They can't make them enforce that law. You have to follow the law, but you don't have to enforce that law. Uh, that's a little bit different situation in our, in our context of Utah. Um, because basically you have a situation where um, uh, 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 someone in California would get a permit in Utah, carry that gun in California, presumably be arrested for doing it, uh, and then bring a challenge. And they would say, I have a right to carry my gun. Federal, and the state would say, well, no, you don't. Our state says discretionary permitting, and you don't have a permit. And he'd say, aha, supremacy of federal law. Not any officer being in, required to enforce federal law, other than the courts themselves. Um, but you'd sue in federal court, they'd be federal officers. Right, so the idea is it's just a different mechanism by which it's working. We have sanctuary cities because federal government can't 
force state officers to do something. But federal law is still supreme over state law. And a federal law that gives you a right to do something will take precedence over a state law that, does, that denies you that right. Oh, we've got to stop. Oh, we've got to stop. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you for that lovely introduction.